your soul with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Verse 3. Judgment is coming, all will be there, each one receiving justly his due. Hide in the saving, sin-cleansing blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Oh, great compassion, oh, boundless love, oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. So all of you come in and join us, we'll have prayer. Holy Fathers, we come to you in prayer. We unite together, asking our hearts to bless our second service here on the Lord's Day. Thank you for each and every one that's come. Pray that you bless those that are traveling, those that are ill, different, different needs of the church today. Thank you for your goodness. Bless in Christ's name. Amen. Let's go ahead and sing. It's Blessed Redeemer. Blessed Redeemer. Okay. One hundred twelve. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Verse 3. Oh, for how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find end? Through years unnumbered on heaven's shore, my tongue shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. I do appreciate that uh, we can continue on. We've had such uh, really beautiful special music. Uh, through the month, really enjoyed that this morning, and um, it's been a blessing too to have Miss Nancy come on over the piano, and Ella's now jumped up on the organ there, and it's really been a, it's been a blessing to me. We continue on. Churches go through changes and cycles and things, and you just keep on going. Exodus chapter 34 won't be a long message. Trust to be a blessing to you for coming into second service. 
I think we'll have to send my Bible off to get rebound. The whole back of it's come off. <laughs> If I get it rebound one more time, I think it, think it'll last me and get me through. You know how you hate to start a new one. I've done that two or three times, but this one I got so much in. I don't, I don't want to lose it all. But the other day I was, like I said, I was at Sam's and I bought that twenty pack or twenty four pack of yellow tablets, and I, I got to look at it and I said, man, that'll be the end of my career when I get through those. And then I went in the office and I opened the cabinet where I'd put them and I didn't realize some of them got transferred and I, I looked in there and I, was on the back. I said, man, I'm, I'm going to be shorter than I thought. Uh, then I realized they got transferred and put in different cabinets, different, different places. So Exodus, Exodus 34, verses 1 through 8. And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tables the words that were in the first tables which thou breakest, and be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mount, and no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount. Neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up into the mount, or mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him. And he took in his hand the two tables of stone. And the Lord descended in the cloud, in the cloud, and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord thy God, the Lord, the Lord thy God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children, unto the third and the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. Now I think that's an interesting passage, especially if you've been reading the Bible through and we came through this and it just dawns on us and kind of hits us that the Ten Commandments on the tables of stone, there's several things we, we, this, we should take note of. They're small enough that they could fit in the Ark of the Covenant which was a chest, ark, a box, or chest that was only two by four, two by two by four. And uh, we know there would be a bowl of manna in that. We know there would be Aaron's rod that was in that. And then we'll know there's the tables, the tablets of the Ten Commandments in there. And it is in the scriptures that they're called the Ten Commandments. In this same passage, look at Exodus chapter 34. Look over in verse number 30, uh, 28, verse 28. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. He had to be supernaturally sustained, that's for sure. And he wrote upon the table, the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So we realize it is, and this is not the only place, I think one other place it's called the Ten Commandments. That's what was on those tablets of stone. So to fit in that chest or that box, and to realize that they be made of stone, they were carryable. So more than just that huge monument down at the courthouse where this, they're this big and it weighs a ton, you know, or something you've seen pictures of like memorial stones like out of granite at a, a headstone of a grave or something like that. These were obviously able to be carried by Moses and then later put in a box or in that chest to be, to be stored. So we take note of that. Guess what else we take note of? This is not the first set. This is the second set. The first set in the scriptures, I believe we'll find it back in chapter 32, verse 15 and 16. And Moses turned and went down from the mount 
and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other were they written. Sound like two-sided. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. <clears throat> That's the first set. And that first set, in Moses' hand, written on both sides. But Moses didn't hew that set out. God did. And the writing on it, God did. And... Uh, the only other place that comes familiar to me about the writing of God is when David was saying in Psalms 8, I, are we there this Wednesday night, one of the nighttime Psalms? When I consider the moon and the stars, the work of thy fingers. And then the other place we see that is, oh, Belshazzar's having a party, and he's blasphemous enough to bring out the, the, the furnishings of the Solomon's temple. So he wants it drink from those golden bowls and use those fine silverware that was dedicated to the Lord for an idolatrous pagan party. Oh, and he looks up in the middle of that party and sees the finger of God writing on the wall. And hence we get the saying, the writing's on the wall. Uh, so I think of these three places where we say, with the finger of God, God wrote those commandments in that stone. And Moses brings them down for the first hillside, and you know what takes place. He witnesses the he witnesses the idolatrous worship party. And I say party, idol, idolatrous worship con uh, congregation taking place. And we realize it is. Look at verse twenty five of, of chapter thirty two. I believe it is verse verse twenty five. And when Moses saw that the people were naked. For an Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Not only did they have a golden calf, and not only was the music so Joshua said, it sounds like there's a war taking place in the camp. When Joshua heard, he said, it sounds like the sound of war. Moses, it doesn't sound like anybody winning or losing. That's not war. He knows what sound of battle would sound like, and he comes down and finds out it's an idolatrous worship party. And they, they are scantily clad. It says they're naked. They've got a golden calf. You know, Moses has been up on that mount. It started in chapter 20. He's been up there all this time. In the first gathering, Exodus chapter 19, it was to be a holy meeting with God. They were supposed to have three days of prayer, fasting, cleaning up, washing, showering, I say showering, cleaning up. They were to refrain from any, any uh, physical pleasures. They were playing, refrain from sexual relationships. And they said they were supposed to present themselves at the foot of that mount, but not come up to it, not even touch it, because that's the holiness of God on the mount. That's what they experienced in Exodus 19. Thundering and lightning and cloud and the rumbling. And stay back. You know, anybody... Anybody gets close. This is a death penalty. Cause and Moses is up there getting the Ten Commandments. You see where this springs off. And guess what? The first thing he writes down. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind. Well, or he didn't write down. Boy, God graves that in the stones. Got it. Second thing graven down. Thou shalt not take it, make in thee any graven uh, images. You're not to fashion or form any symbols for God. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain or make it useless. And remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Sanctify it. It's a holy day to remember a holy God. <laughs> Moses is coming down off the mount. I'm just paraphrasing to get us to where we're at. First thing, he, you know, it's war taking place, Joshua says. Join him. No, it's... That's something different in war. He gets down there and he sees all the commandments of God are broke before he even gets off the mountain. There's an idol. There's people parading around naked. 
And think of all the licentious behavior and thoughts and things taking place. Now the people, to their shame, the way they're behaving, to their shame, enemies. I said this before. You used to be able to go and ask a lost person, how do you think a Christian ought to behave? And they'd say, let's just use, pick on the preacher. Say, what do you, how do you think a preacher ought to behave? Well, a preacher ought not smoke. Okay, how do you think a preacher ought to behave? Well, a preacher ought not to be doing uh, drinking. It just seems foreign that the lost people used to think a preacher shouldn't stand around with a Budweiser in her hand. A lot of people used to think that a preacher shouldn't, you know, uh, be, it be playing at the pool hall. Well, even my first pastor, my first pastor just thought it was a sin for believers to have a pool table in their house. <laughs> um, I think a hunter and cricket Philip, when they got saved, and he had he actually had a pool hall in his house for his buddies and all of them come over to. When he got saved, he as soon as he got saved, they wanted to start entertaining Christians at their house, and so he he put a con, he wrapped his uh, Miller light lights with con, construction paper so he, so folks wouldn't see a beer sign in his in his house <laughs> at his pool table. But because folks had this idea that Christians shouldn't lie, Christians and preachers shouldn't drink, Christian preachers shouldn't. Well, I'm going to tell you this for sure. God's people shouldn't be parading around naked. And licentious behavior. And they shouldn't be committing adultery. And they, and they come down there and shouldn't have, a, <clears throat> shouldn't have a golden idol of a calf. Now, that seems just like a dumb choice, but it actually was a god of Egypt. The calf that would rise from the Nile River, a god of f fertility and a god of power and so they actually were imitating a god of Egypt because I would sure think someone with any common sense, if you was going to make a symbol for your god, you wouldn't make a cow, you know, or a calf. I've seen enough of those on the farm to realize they wouldn't make much of a god, <laughs> haven't you? <laughs> but then again, gods of Egypt were a black beetle too. The pharaohs were, were buried with golden little black beetles. Hmm. <clears throat> You think, well, that just doesn't make sense. Well, you can go to India today with a missionary and find out that people will venerate a cow and a beetle and a rat. Why? It's an ancestral god. And I think all of us in this room today, safe to say, we've seen enough about rats that they don't make much of a god either. But it's a god of nature, symbolizing some type of power. Well, you get the idea. Moses, in his anger, did something. He smashed the Ten Commandments. Now they're engraved in stone. He not only smashes them, if you read in Exodus 32, he said, and he strawed it upon the water. The water that flew, flowed from the mouth of all the people, he strawed it upon the water and made the people drink it. <laughs> you think Moses was upset? How angry would you have to be at your kids if you came home and you saw them doing something and you so many, you have profaned the good name of this family, the good name of this family that your father built, the good name of your family that your grandfather. I'm going over to this grandfather clock that your grandfather made, and with all its ornate uh, workings and all its beautiful wood furnishing, and I'm going to smash this grandfather clock to bits, and I'm going to put it on the plate, and for lunch, you're eating it. You'd have to be pretty upset, wouldn't you? Punish the kids, but don't break the clock, right? Because that's the best piece of furniture in the house, if I can use it by way of illustration. Moses took the commandments that God engraved. And he's so angry with the people. He smashes the Ten Commandments, straws it on the water, throws it in the, stream, the streams that they're drinking from, and that's what they're going to drink. Gets you an idea, doesn't it? How holy God is in that first seating and how the breaking of the Ten Commandments, how angered with Moses was that the Ten Commandments were broken ere they came off the mount, is how I'd say it. Man's a sinner. Now, I'm going to say something. None of this took God by surprise. The nation and the house of Israel the very root which God reveals and how he's used them does not take God's surprise. I want you to see how God describes this nation of Israel. 
Look at Exodus chapter 32, verse 9. <coughs> and the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Look at chapter 33, verse 3, where God's calling them to go into Egypt, or out of Egypt into Canaan, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Now God led them with a pillar of fire, and God led them with a cloud, assembling of his Holy Spirit, Shekinah glory. He led them, but when he gave Moses the instructions to build the tabernacle, after this episode of Mount Sinai, isn't it interesting? He said, I will not be in the middle of them. You build my, put my tabernacle out on the outside of the camp. Now think of this. He said, I will not be associated with being in the middle of this. If anybody wants to meet with God, you're going to have to come over here. God is not even going to be associated with being in the middle of those people. Give you an idea that God knows this is not, this is not a condemnation of Jewish people. Matter of fact, uh, we're just seeing the root of Scripture teaching here. We're commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and to love and, and to support the apple of God's eye. But he knows who he called. Look at chapter 34, verse number 9. <clears throat> and he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my people, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine own inheritance. And I even see the prayer of Moses in agreement with God. This is one. Well, here's the root word from the root, stiff neck, meaning hard to lead, stubborn, proud, rebellious, resistant. The, we get an idea of this if you try and lead, lead around a, a stubborn mule. Uh, any, anybody, if you, have, you ever have an old stubborn horse or stubborn mule or donkey? I'm telling you what. If they don't want to go and you begin to pull on the reins or the halter, their neck gets stiff. And buddy, they're strong. And you say, well, even with the bridle and stuff like that, this is not going to work. So you've got to put a bit in their mouth or a breaker bit in their mouth. So it kind of gives them a little persuasion that, oh, that hurts when I try and pull it. Why? Because they, they got their own will and they got their own way. That's exactly what he's saying. He said, I know who I'm called here. I know who I'm using. God himself recognized from Mount, si at Mount Sinai even to Moses' prayer. This is a resistant, proud, hard people. Now, let's look at the analytics. Look with me with the Deuteronomy chapter 7. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, a man of delabored point. <coughs> Deuteronomy the second giving of the law. The, the, the law that God gave um, Moses, Ten Commandments, how to civil law, ceremonial law, religious law, it's repeated. Even the Ten Commandments are repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For thou art a ho an holy people unto the Lord. Now, holy is not capitalized here. It's not talking about something of the Holy, Sp uh, the S holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. It's the idea that is the very word set apart. For thou art a set apart people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. There is a special, unique calling for Israel, for the Jews. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. When God ordained and chose to establish the Jewish nation, there were two of them, <laughs> Abraham and Sarah. And by the way, it takes those two, male and female, to have any more. Voila, things we learn in church. Okay. 
<clears throat> but the nation of Israel was founded with two people. When they went into Egypt, the numbers given of their names, the 12 sons of Jacob, sons of Isaac, sons of Abraham, there were 70 of them. That's not a big nation by any stretch of the imagination. God did not choose them because of how many there were. Hmm, this is a big noble people and a lot of them. Man, we can make a great nation out of that. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out of the, with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy unto them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And it's like perpetual. This shows you that God can take two and by his promise make it innumerable. It's the stars of heaven, the sands of the seas, and throughout all the generations. And we think of the generations from Abraham and now, we, we wouldn't even know a number for how many Jews, if there, how many there's been. It's been innumerable. He didn't choose them because of their numbers. And here's what I think. Most people, success, number, equate success with numbers. A business is successful if it makes more money. Sports is, sports is built on this. Uh, who? The analytics of basketball players, NBA, they have a stat sheet on each player that has this, a plus or a minus of how many points the team scores, your value to the team, are you plus 8, are you plus 10, are you plus 12? Each player on that bench, they have an analytic sheet. If when they're on the court, when that player's on the court, they have a minus two, that means your team scores two less points than the other team. You are a detriment if you're on the court, and so they combine the analytics of plus or minus of a player. Are you a positive or a negative? Baseball. Baseball is notorious for its statistics. You can get into the Hall of Fame in baseball if you are successful hitting a ball three out of ten times. That puts you in the Hall of Fame. It means you batted 300. If you have an RBI listing, that's positive. <clears throat> if you bat number three, four, five, six in a batting order of a, of, of a team, you want your statistics for RBIs, runs batted in. That means they can put you there because hopefully someone's on base and you can knock them in better than player number eight, nine, and eight, nine, one, and two. One and two is you're small enough and fast enough to get on base. Three, four, five, or four, five, and six means you're, you're good enough to knock them in. Your batting average is high enough to get run production. Sports is built on that. You're successful if your numbers are higher, your percentages. Are you positive or negative? And people look at, people would look and say, well, the house of Israel, it wasn't the numbers, was it? They're not successful because of numbers. God knew that. He's shown something here. And not only that, look at Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4. Unless we get too proud, <coughs> Deuteronomy 9, Moses continues to speak before he gives us the giving of the law again. Speak not thou in thine heart. After that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee. Oh yeah, we're going in the promised land. Because of how good we are, we're going to read it. And he's, he's moving these pagan tribes out of this land because how good. Speak not before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess the land. But for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness or for the uprightness of thine heart dost thou go in to possess their land. But for the wickedness of the nations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord spake unto his fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if I went back to Genesis 15, I'd read where God promised Abraham the land of Canaan, but not for 400 years till the cup of the iniquity of the Amorites is full. I'm going to allow them to live here 400 more years till their cup of sinning is, is flowing over. But what he cautions Israel is, I didn't choose you because of your numbers. He refused. 
And I didn't choose you because of how good you are. Don't say, it's our righteousness that we're getting this. Whew, we earn this thing. It's how sinful they are. I'm driving them out. I'm just letting you have that land. Now, isn't that interesting? No, in the scriptures. Because before they ever came down off the ten, ever came down off the Mount Sinai, the Ten Commandments were broke, er, broke before ere they hit the ground, before they ever came down. God wasn't taken by surprise. He knew he called. In Exodus chapter 34, he says, Moses, make another set. Make another set of stones. Let's have another holy day. Keep everyone back. And guess what? Moses, come back up here for another 40 days and 40 nights. And let's write them again. And that's the set we'll put in there. Could you always remember this? Whenever we talk about the Ark of the Covenant, let's always remember the set of commandments in there. It's the second set, and they were the first set was broke. It reminds us of the brokenness of the commandments and the sinfulness of people. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, and I'm going to have to even cut my introduction a page short because it's, when I'm coming to, I want you to see how often in the, in the Old Testament God gives a second, a second go around and it starts with the commandments. And folks, that include divorce. How many things God makes provision for in the Old Testament? Because he knows people. He knows what he called. He knows what he's promised to give us, and he knows he has to provide for us. And a lot of times he has to give us a second set. Interesting, isn't it? Um, Ephesians 2. Let's just end with that. And we'll leave the second page to later. I'm getting there. Verse number, let's even cut that down. Verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God. This passage has to do with he has called us. He has quickened us and made us alive. He has called us. He has set us in heavenly places. And now I want you to get a reminder. Not because of how many of us there are. Matter of fact. Broad is the way it leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. If you there be to find it, true Christians are the minority. Never have been the majority. Jesus said that. And, but this passage, <clears throat> not because how good we are. In the ages to come, everyone in the kingdom of God, in the present, sitting in heavenly places, will come to this same basic conclusion. It's because of him. He knew what he called. He knew what he got when he called it. And by his grace, I'm here. And I think of this passage. But God commended his love toward us. Have you ever commended someone for their work? Have you ever committed someone to a job? You probably gave good, it means you gave good references to it to uh, prove the, the, you validated their worthiness. God validated his love towards us. Well, how did he validate that love? In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He knew what he's calling. He knew what he was getting. And he just proved and that's why, as I head into the second page and stop right here, that's why when the second time he goes up there and he calls Moses up there to get the second side, he gives two whole verses. He said, 
I'm a merciful God. And I'm a long-suffering God. Write a second set. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? And Moses could sit there and say, I'm sure grateful that you gave us, you're giving us another set. Let's see if we can spring off that in the Lord willing the next Sunday afternoon or two when God makes provisions in places he does so. Holy Father, thank you for, for what we learn from your scriptures. The blessings of your grace. Bless this week before us in Jesus' name. Amen.